How are we all? I hope all is well. My name is Sachin, and this is the Total Cricket Podcast, Episode 4. Just before we'd start, if you'd like to check out the podcast, there's links to all our platforms. We've got iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Twitter, where you can find all the links there as well. But now, let's get right into the podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about the impact of leg spinners and extreme conditions in modern cricket. So I'd like to start off with this. There's a trend in modern cricket that, if you've been paying attention, has become very prominent, and that is the art of leg spin bowling has been revived. After Shane Warne retired in 2007, a lot of people were spelling the death of leg spin bowling, that that was it. There was a dearth of leg spinners for a little bit, yes. But now the art seems to have been reborn, with particularly, I think, the advent of 2020 cricket, the leg spinners have excelled, and now with the modern one-day cricket, the rule changes that have taken place, the off-spin is becoming less of a threat. The leg spinners have come to the fore now, which is great to see. And there's proof to the pudding in this one. Look at the top ODI wicket-takers from out-of-spinners, that is, out-of-spinners in the last two years since the 2015 World Cup had concluded. Imran Tahir, Adil Rashid, and Rashid Khan are top by a long way, three leg spinners. And if you want to look at the top seven, there are five leg spinners. You've got Graham Creamer and Adam Zampa coming in in sixth and seventh. So you can see that leg spinners are becoming the dominant form of spin. Off spinners, are less effective in limited overs cricket now because you've got 11 to 40 overs only forming out. So the batsman is more willing to take on the off spinner rather than just milk them around. Then you've got the advent of two new balls. The ball stays harder. It's easier to hit them. And the pitches are becoming flatter. There's less help for the finger spinner. And you've got smaller boundaries, bigger bats. Just a more aggressive approach to batting. And the off spinner is becoming a liability. The leg spinner, you could argue, faces all these problems, but there's one big difference. The leg spinner spins the ball both ways. Look at those top leg spinners. Imran Tahir, Adil Rashid, Rashid Khan, they bowl terrific googlies, and that threat of spinning the ball both away from the bat and into the bat, bringing several modes of dismissal into play that aren't really a factor with the off spinner. That has created all the problems for the batsman facing them. The other thing is the bounce, the overspin that the leg spinner gets. It makes it very difficult to sweep and reverse sweep them as effectively as you can against the off spinner. Also, if you want to hit them, that overspin, it can get a little bit more drop on the ball. It's going to drop on you. You can get a top edge, you can skew it, get caught. That's the beauty of the leg spinner. The other thing, that I think is important to note about the leg spinner is that when it comes to the way they bowl, they have adopted a more flatter trajectory, I feel, in the modern game. Look at Imran Tahir and Rashid Khan, I think two very clear examples of this. They do not give batsmen the chance to come down the ground and hit them over the top, straight down the ground. They bowl flat into the wicket makes it really difficult for the batsman. Their footwork becomes muddled. It really limits the scoring options of the batsman, and you're really relying on them on a hard tracker to get away. Whereas the off-spinner, you have that sort of very similar length that they will bowl. You can, I feel, line them up more. So all in all, we have seen this advent of leg spinners taking over from off-spinners, which I think is great to see. Leg spin bowling is really fun to watch. It's a joy to watch great leg spin bowling. And I want to tie this to the second ODI between Sri Lanka and Zimbabwe. Now compare Sri Lanka's performance with the ball in the second ODI to the first ODI. There was one big difference. In the first ODI, they picked two off spinners, Akila Dhananja and Amila Ponso. In the second ODI, they picked two leg spinners, Lakshan Sandakan and Moni Duhasaranga. Now, guess what happened? With the leg spinners, they pulled Zimbabwe out for 160. With the off-spinners, Zimbabwe chased down 316 in a canter. 
look at the difference in the figures. The off spinners combined for one wicket, going for a combined seven runs and over. The leg spinners, they were still a tad expensive, yes, a bit over five runs and over, but the key is they took seven wickets between them, particularly in those middle overs. And that is the beauty of the leg spinner bat. You have to take wickets in the middle overs to stop that charge. Teams line up so that they can go hard in the back 10, back 15 overs. If you take wickets in the middle, you're restricting their potential in those overs. That is exactly what Sri Lanka did against Zimbabwe in this game. Sunder Khan, he needs to play. Give him more time. He may have the odd bad game. But it is crucial that Sri Lanka have an aggressive mentality to bowling that has been lacking for a long time in their limited overs bowling. Wanidu Hasabangra is a young 19 year old all around that hits big fields well and he bowls leg spin with variety. They need to persist with him. Hopefully, an upgrade on C could get the sun in that ball. Hopefully, a legitimate all rounder. They need to give these players time. Don't just play them a couple of games and drop them. Give them a couple of series. We need to be patient with these players. Congratulations to Wanidu Hasabangra, the third player to get a hat trick on the Bui in ODIs. Interestingly, the last two wickets were good movies. That was great to see from an all-rounder, not a front-line leg spin. To have that variety to your leg spin point, I think is fantastic. He must be persisted with. And it was also good to see Dushmant Dush Chamira back. He didn't bowl his best, but he is another one that Sri Lanka need to persist with. Quick, quick bowler. He has a lot of potential, and hopefully he can stay injury-free. For Zimbabwe, I think the batting, that formula that they had in the first game of sweeping, reverse sweeping, it wasn't as effective against the leg spinners. That over spin, that extra bounce at the leg spinners, he had definitely trouble them. You look at Ryan Doyle's dismissal, Sikandar Raza's dismissal, sweeping and reverse sweeping. There was a big difference in the outcome from this game to the last game. Apart from that, I think they were a bit muddled after Sean Williams' dismissal, where he just hit a full toss straight to deep square leg. I think they were a bit muffled in their approach, whether to consolidate or to keep going hard, and in the end, it just capitulated. As I thought, the first story I was just a blip. Zimbabwe are nowhere near being an elite team. They have some talent, but ultimately, they have bigger issues that I've explained in the previous podcast. And hopefully, they can be competitive for the rest of the series, but I wonder if that first game was about as good as it gets for Zimbabwe. Now, on the bowling side, they didn't have much to bowl with. It's a bit hard. Tendai Chitara, he ran in hard. Got to give him respect for that. From the Sri Lankan batting point of view, I got to say, we need to talk about Putarata. I got to give him kudos. He did a great job. You know, that's three 50s in a row in ODI cricket. He is the bandage of Sri Lanka cricket. If you need to plug a gap, he's your man. And he does it without fuss. He's a calm character. I have been a critic of him. I think... His technique is not up to the mark in Test cricket. I think for the potential he's had, he has underperformed. But now, with the lack of experience in the team, he's a crucial component. He just got over 6,000 ODI runs. That's a great achievement. He's playing well. At the end of the day, he's done good things for Sri Lanka cricket, and he is a crucial part. So, well done, Hultanga. Keep up the good work. And Dinesh Chandumar, what must he be thinking after seeing these two wins from Taranga? He's looking now, not to mention Kusar Pereira, injured. Dinesh Chandimar looking like that he might find himself on the out in the limit of his game. So we'll have to watch that space, but it does not look good for him. Now, moving on to the other thing I'd like to talk about today is the impact of extreme conditions in the modern game. Now, I think that the modern game is being played in extreme conditions more often than not. There is this gravitation towards playing on extreme conditions, whether that is a batting paradise or a minefield or a green top. There is this migration towards extreme conditions rather than, as you would say, a good cricket wicket that offers a little bit for everyone. And India have fallen foul of these extreme conditions in the recent past. The first test match against Australia in Pune, they played on a minefield. Steve O'Keefe, a serviceable left-arm orthodox bowler. Not amazing, took 12 wickets, was unplayable, and India got hammered in that game. Then, look at the Champions Trophy at the Oval on a batting paradise. 
India is a better team than Sri Lanka. They have a better bowling attack and a better batting lineup. Sri Lanka chased down 320 comfortably in those conditions. And then, just yesterday, on the slow, low wicket in the West Indies, in Antigua, India lost. They could not chase down 189 that the West Indies set. All of these things tell me that extreme conditions create parity. They bring teams close together. I believe that on a good cricket wicket, that is the best test of true skill. The better team is going to come out on top. But when you play on these extreme conditions, I'm not saying that the lesser team will win every game, but it gives them a better chance. These extreme conditions bring the lesser team into the game. It creates more level playing field, and India have really been a victim of extreme conditions in the last six months. In this game, what can I say? West Indies batting absolutely woeful, as always. Very poor. Kuldeep Yadav did a great job. Hardik Pandya did a great job with four. But India's batting, that was the main talking point. The fact that they couldn't chase down 189. Really, very poor. Mahindra Singh Dhoni, 54 of 114. Now, I think this is the biggest talking point. Dhoni, is he on the decline? I think that is a very simple answer. Yes, he is on the decline. He's passed his best. But I think the biggest question for India, looking ahead to the 2019 World Cup, do you get rid of Dhoni or do you hold him to it? He's just about to turn 36. Now, do you let go of all that experience for someone younger, maybe like a Rishabh Pant or a Manish Pandey, or do you keep him when you know he is past his prime? He is not the finisher he once was. I look at him batting, there's a lethargy. I understand that that is part of Dhoni's demeanour. He, he is a laconic character. He's the Iceman. He's not going to show that fire, that passion. But there's a lack of urgency to his batting. His strike rates are getting lower and lower. Recent 2020s as well, his strike rate has been poor. I believe that that ability he had to just hit big sixes, fours, in the clutch, at will, is disappearing. And he's really struggling to connect. He's really struggling to connect these big shots. I think we are seeing his star fading. But I'm not sure what India should do at the moment. Do they hold on to him? Do they let him go? I think that's going to be a very interesting plot line throughout the next couple of years. As for the West Indies bowling, Jason Holder with his first five wicket all in ODI cricket, he is blossoming into a very good all round cricketer. I feel sorry for him. He really shouldn't be the captain. He should be working on his game in his infancy of his international career, but instead the captaincy has been thrust upon him. And it's very difficult for him, but I really like him as a character. He never complains. He really cares about it. You can see the passion with which he plays. I think he's a calm character, though. He's a strong leader. He looks like a guy who demands respect from his players. I like him a lot. And I think that the West Indies are really lucky that he's there to captain the team. Because without him as the captain, I don't even want to begin to think what things might be. If it's this bad now without him, wow. I've got to say as well, great bowling from Kesarik Williams in his second ODI. One for 29, keeping Dhoni quiet, and in the end, getting Dhoni off the last ball of his spell. Devendra Bishu, Ashley Nurse, also very economical. This is what I mean by these extreme conditions where lesser skilled players become very, very potent. Ashley Nurse is a run of the mill off spinner. He is nothing special, and he was difficult to hit off the square in this game. This is what I mean by these extreme conditions. You bridge that gap between the quality of the two teams. And that's why I think this result occurred. Do all that West Indies or all of a sudden an amazing team in India are batting? Of course not. I still fully expect India to win the fifth ODI. But I think for the West Indies, the problem is whenever they have a good win, they never, never can back it up. They won the test match in, in the UAE against Pakistan, then they go on to lose the next one comfortably, then they win that second game in the Caribbean against Pakistan, then they lose the decider. 
they win the World T20 twice? Does did those two tribes do anything to boost their potential? Absolutely not. They were just back to reality after those tournaments. Those tournaments were like playing in an alternate universe in the West Indies, and they came crashing back down to reality the minute those tournaments ended. So ultimately, as I discussed in the previous podcast, West Indies cricket has bigger issues than on the field, a lot of problems off the field. And ultimately, the future does not look bright for the West Indies. But for India, again, I can't really say that this is a big deal for them. It's one of those things they'll have to learn. But yes, in terms of extreme conditioning, I think what we're finding is that we play so much cricket in extreme conditions that when you get a good cricket wicket, teams are almost, they don't know what to do. Look at the card you pitched in the Champions Trophy. That was a good cricket wicket. You could score, you put your head down. But if you put the ball in the right areas, you could take wickets. And you saw England in that semi-final. They didn't know what to do. Their mindset was completely flustered. They were all over the place against Pakistan. That was a good cricket wicket. That wasn't a minefield. And yet they crumbled on that pitch. Now the good cricket wickets are almost becoming the hardest to play on because it's a simple thing of practice. Players are not playing on these wickets a lot. Players play most of their cricket in extreme conditions. So, really, the advent of this really absurd home advantage that teams are creating in these bilateral series is, I believe, affecting how teams play on good cricket wicket. Going on absurd home advantages, the West Indies put out slow and low pitches against a subcontinent team. We talk about teams going to the to the end of the earth, above and beyond, to create home advantages, and the West Indies are giving the away team home advantage. Just another reason why West Indies are not going anywhere fast in their current state. So the final thing I want to talk about today is the third round of matches from the ICC Women's World Cup 2017. Very interesting round of matches to start off with. The West Indies shot out for 48 by South Africa. Can you believe it? The second lowest score in women ODI's history. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Look at Dane Van Nierke, the captain's figures. 3.2 overs, 3 maiders, 4 for none. Those are the most amazing figures I've ever seen. Once again, the leg spinner doing the damage. No surprises there. South Africa with that four-pronged pace attack. They have arguably the best attack in the competition. Marizan Cup, Shabi Ismail, who is the fastest ball in women's cricket, Ayabonga Kaka, and Mosleen Daniels. That is a nice, nice four-pronged pace attack with Sune Luz and Dane Van Dierke, the leg spinners, to help. They've got a lot of firepower in South Africa, looking really, really nice to get to the semis. Now, as for the West Indies, once again, their batting lets them down dearly. The biggest thing is that their three best players, DeAndre Dotton, Stefani Taylor, and Hayley Matthews, have not fired. There have been no 50s between them, and that has really been the problem. They rely so heavily on them that without them, you get these medium scores, 200, 180, and now 48. That is not good enough against these teams in the women's cricket now. They can chase down big totals. They can chase down 300s. So it is nowhere near enough that the West Indies have been getting I think the biggest thing is coming to these truer, faster wickets. They've struggled to adapt, particularly the players who haven't played in the WBBL and the Kia Super League. Players who have basically played all their cricket on those slow, lower pitches in the West Indies have found it really difficult to adjust. But it's very disappointing to see. I thought the West Indies, off the back of their win in the World T20, they were going to push on, but it looks like they are going to have a swift exit to this tournament. As for South Africa, as I said, looking very nice. On to the next game, England against Sri Lanka. England easily chasing down 200. Head the ninth, doing the damage very nice. Sarah Taylor getting a 50 as well. Great to see her after having her anxiety problems. She's made a comeback to cricket. It's a good story. I hope that her mental health is now well. I think for England, this was a clinical performance. We didn't really learn anything. They look pretty good to make the semis. Even after the clip against India, I expect them to win five of their seven games. As for Sri Lanka, getting 200 for them is a big deal. Especially when Charmri Atapattu did not get into double figures. That's a good effort for them. But again, against a team like England, they need to score much bigger runs. Charmri Atapattu is the player that can move the needle on the score. If she gets big ones, they can push those 250s, 260s. 
But even that with their bowling attack is not enough. They don't have the fast bowlers. The spinners on these pitches are less effective. They're all off spinners. So, unfortunately, they lack penetration. And it's very, very easy for these bigger teams to wipe the floor with them. Going on to the next game, the big game from the round. India versus Pakistan. The biggest rival in world cricket. India getting a poultry, poultry score. Only getting to 150. And that's a lot. Well, Pakistan's in the game. Only for Pakistan to get rolled for 74. Excellent bowling. Hector Bish, she did very, very nicely. Deepthi Sharma as well. The spinners really wrecking havoc against a Pakistani batting lineup that doesn't have that power hitting in it. India scraping to 150. Shushka Plummer down the order, getting a nice little cameo to get them there. But really, as I said, for Pakistan, they lack that ability to score quickly, to score big runs. It's a big problem against these better teams. India, obviously the pitch was difficult to bat on, but it was good for them, I think, where their batting has been dominant for their bowling to win them the game. They have a good balanced team. Three from three now wins for them. They are becoming a big power in women's cricket now. And I think that they look very nice to make the semis. And I think that win, the fact that India and South Africa have started so well, has put pressure on New Zealand and England to get into the semis. Those two teams, you'd always expect them to get to the semis, but now there's pressure on them. One of them may miss out. So that's going to be very interesting to see how it unfolds. Looking at the last game of the round, Australia versus New Zealand. Australia chasing down 200 from no, 220 from New Zealand. You see a couple of 50s, Susie Bates, Katie Perkins, but not that big score that you need for Australia. Great stuff from Jess Jonathan, Megan Shoot, doing the business with the ball. And then he's Perry with the bat, chasing it down. A little bit of a wobbly chase, but in the end, comfortable. Elise Perry, interesting to see that she's become more of a batting all-rounder. She started her career as a bowling all-rounder, but now her batting is really coming to the fore. Really looking good in that number four spot. With the ball, I feel she's lost a bit of penetration. She's not the wicked tank as she was. I almost feel like the batsmen respect her and they look to to play her as a, in a different way that, you know, sometimes the part-timer can get a few cheap wickets because the batsman just loses a bit of concentration. I think that batsmen respect at least Perry. The other thing is that the extra pace that she generates can be easier to hit. But yes, still think she's a fantastic all-round cricketer, the leading all-rounder in women's cricket. Looking at Australia, they look so good, so good. They are big favourites for this tournament. Look at their team, that batting lineup they have. Beth Mooney, who else? Beth Mooney, Meg Lanning, Alyssa Healy, Alex Blackwell, Elise Perry, Nicole Bolton. That's just their top seven. Eight and nine are Jess Johnson and Ashley Gardner, who would bat in the top four for their WBBL teams. Ashley Gardner started her international career as a number three who just bowled a little bit of off-spin. In this tournament, she's become a bowler who bats today. That is the depth that Australian women's cricket has. And really, other teams will have to emulate. The biggest reason for this is that Australian women's cricket has been the most professional. It has developed the quickest. You look at the wages now that are being offered for Australian women's cricket. It's very good. The game's professional. And it becomes natural. They have the infrastructure. They have the fitness, the dieting plans, they have the ability to work full-time on their cricket, whereas these other countries, they need another job. They don't have the infrastructure. They haven't pumped the money into women's cricket. That is where Australian women's cricket is setting itself apart from the rest. They're doing a fantastic job, and hopefully all the other countries can take a note out of their book, and hopefully in 10 years' time we'll see many more countries like Australia, what they're doing now, develop. Women's cricket is evolving very quickly, and hopefully... In the next 10 years, we see more evolution like that in the women's game. For New Zealand, now the pressure's on. After that washout, unfortunately, against South Africa, they've got three points from three games. All of a sudden, with South Africa and India starting really well, the pressure's on, no doubt about that. Looking at the table, Australia and India with perfect records. South Africa, they won all their games past the washout. England, two wins and loss. New Zealand, one of each. All those teams, no doubt, in the fight for the semis, four of those five are certainly going to be the semi-finalists. 
the West Indies, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, all winless. Sri Lanka, Pakistan don't have the batting firepower. West Indies, they really fail to adapt to conditions. They have the firepower, but they just have not adapted. And I feel that psychologically, those first few losses may have impacted them in that crushing defeat against South Africa. So, yes, that is it for today. Hopefully, you enjoyed the podcast. You can check out the links, iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Twitter gives you all the links in one place. Next podcast, I'll be doing a preview of the England-South Africa test series. I'll be talking about the saga of the Australian pay dispute, as well as some other things in the world of cricket. But until next time, thanks for listening, and I'll see you later.